I was sent an email uh, by Dr. Bob Gill uh, in the last couple of weeks about a, a story, and uh, I wasn't sure what it was about, but he sent me an email with a video, uh, and I'm just going to play the video, and then we're going to speak to uh, Bob Gill. Yeah, I want to um, bring your attention back to uh, this recent employment tribunal case involving Chris Day. You mentioned the importance of making staff thrive. I've heard about your thorough whistling, whistleblowing statement. But the events of just a couple of weeks ago actually contradict some of the statements I've heard today. I'm here, I'm Dr. Bob Gill, I'm a GP. Uh, my patients have been accessing your service for 18 years, as long as I've been there. I'm deeply worried by the standards of clinical care delivered by this trust. I want to address the board. So, as a person representing patients, NHS campaigners, health professionals, and members of the public, we are deeply concerned about matters arising from our observations, reporting, and court submissions relating to the June-July 2022 16-day employment tribunal hearing for the claimant, Dr. Chris Day, and the respondent, Lewisham and Greenwich Trust. Below we set out the most important issues which require your urgent attention and further action. Concealment of key evidence and contempt of court. Board meeting notes, October 2018. Now this is from just a couple of weeks ago, where evidence was concealed from the tribunal. Lewisham and Greenwich Trust for four years denied the existence of a record of a board meeting that approved a settlement agreement between Dr. Day and the Trust that took place on the evening of Sunday, the 14th of October, 2018. We understand that the meeting record was hidden from Dr. Day and its existence denied to journalists, even a judge, which is contempt of court and a criminal offence. It appears that the board and Dr. Day were not in possession of the whole truth about each other's position when agreeing to the settlement. Uh, Bob Kill, thank you for thank you for joining us. Um, I, was, I was a bit confused by, by the video because um, I didn't really know the background to it, but it, it seems to me what, what's going on there is that an NHS trust is not um, happy for whistleblowers to come forward to talk about what's going wrong in practice. Um, is this something that's not only happening where you are based, um, but elsewhere? Is that a common issue? Well, it's essential for our now corporate corporatized NHS to make sure that any any bad news is buried buried, um, you know how many scandals have we had across the country? We've had recently the maternity scandals in Telford and Shropshire. We've had, uh, you know, mid staffs. What seems to the recurring theme is you have a management bureaucracy which is wanting to make sure that bad news doesn't get out of the trust. And what it ends up doing is making the problem much worse. Now, a bit, a bit of background on the Chris Day case. If people haven't looked into it, I urge them to, because this is a groundbreaking case. It's been going on since 2014. The, the taxpayer through the government have spent over a million pounds defending their position. At the same time, um, smearing Dr. Day and presenting his concerns as minor. The concerns he raised were around the staffing in an intensive care unit where, the, where one doctor, one junior doctor was looking after twice the recommended number of patients in intensive care. They were often unsupervised. So junior doctors starting in ITU were left unsupervised. And he exposed that there were two preventable deaths, one including a untrained junior doctor without supervision poking a chest drain through somebody's liver who then exsanguinated to death. So these are very serious concerns. And for his trouble, he's actually not a true whistleblower. He raised these concerns through the internal channels. And he found that when he went to his appraisal meeting, when he reiterated his concerns, they terminated his career back in 2013, 2014. Now, since then, he's been fighting this case Junior doctors have an employment status with a training body called Health Education England and their trust, 50-50. Uh, 
uh, one of the respondents, one Health Education England, which pays half his wage, managed to successfully argue in court that they weren't his employer. And in doing so, they took away whistleblowing protection, weak that it is, from 54,000 junior doctors. Now, through his legal battle, Dr. Day managed to restore this weak whistleblowing protection to those doctors uh, in a victory in the High Court. So this is a massive case. Um, now, I went to the board recently because I'd been following the most recent tribunal where only the Lewisham and Greenwich Trust are now in the case. But I had just heard them paint a very rosy picture of the care they're providing, how well they look after staff, how important they consider whistleblowing. But what, inf what unfolded in this most recent tribunal was they had prevented the key material medical witnesses from being cross-examined, their own employees, just in case they screwed up. The chief executive had misled the tribunal um, over many facts, and the director of communications for the trust took it upon himself to destroy 90,000 emails. And we also found out that the, the, the main manager within the trust, her, her email record, her whole record of the email, because she was the main person dealing with this claim, has mysteriously been deleted as well, permanently deleted, we're being told. So we have a trust that has prevented the evidence being heard, that has spent over a million with Health Education England preventing the evidence being heard for a doctor who's raised concerns about patients dying unnecessarily. Now I'm telling you the NHS is in a much worse state than when he raised his concerns. We had a leaked report which was estimating about a thousand people a month are dying in hospitals because they're dying in corridors, they're dying in overstretched A and E departments. We've heard about the cost of living crisis. People might die through lack of fuel. They are dying in their thousands as we speak under the noses of this government. Labour are mute about it. Boris Johnson's enjoying his time, uh, what it remains as prime minister. But we have an unfolding, unreported, largely unreported tragedy. Now, I put it to you, if you crush whistleblowers, if you make an example of whistleblowers, if you never let them speak to the public about their concerns, that has a devastating, chilling effect. Now, you know, I sent you a screenshot of a study done by the Manchester Business School a few years ago, uh, based on a few focus groups and interviews. If you show the paragraph that we expanded, which is worth reading, what they describe is, of NHS culture, this was back in 2015 or 16, there seems to be islands and pockets of positive culture. However, the generalized evidence suggests that the NHS is systemically and institutionally deaf, bullying and defensive and dishonest, exhibiting a resistance to knowing, denial, a willful blindness, a dysfunctional, perverse, troubled organization, totalitarian Kafka-esque characteristics are identified. The NHS could also be described as a coercive bureaucracy under certain definitions of a corrupt entity. Mm. Now, between me and you, that sounds very much like the labor, labor leadership as well. Now, how does neoliberalism keep control of society, suppress dissent? What they do is make sure the leaderships of these public organizations toe the line, and crush any dissent and crush any way of informing the public directly. So that's why I'm urging everybody listening into this, do, your, do a bit of reading about the Chris Day case. It's been reported in the mainstream press. Uh, I will put in the chat some important links, follow him on Twitter. And what, what I suggest is there are two key things that there's an action we can do. We can all write to the president of the employment tribunals in England and Wales, a Mr. Barry Clark, and ask him, what, what have you done about the concealment of a contract which proves employment status that the taxpayer funded to deny the existence of, right? Number one, the, in fact, the very lawyers that knew, were representing the, the Health Education England drew up that contract. 
So there's absolutely no excuse. Ignorance is not an excuse. Incompetence is not an excuse. This sounds to me like deliberate concealment in a court. And what have they done about the most recent uh, miscarriage, which is the destruction of evidence, which came played out in the court case, which I followed. So find out about it, write to this president of the employment tribunals, and we need people from all around the country to realize the importance that this case needs justice, because if they manage to crush this case, nobody who wants to preserve a career in working in the NHS and raising patient concerns is safe. Well, it sounds like the NHS is in such a bad state that it's it's they're they're, all, they're almost supporting that uh, erosion of it, these trusts by uh, by not allowing whistleblowers to come forward and improve the quality of care effectively. But the other story that I'd, I'd like to ask you about, <clears throat> sorry about my Dalek voice, um, is the the story I picked up in the Morning Star this week, uh, which which was quite horrific about. Uh, um, an overworked doctor suicide, uh, GP Gail Milligan, who worked up to 70 hours a week, uh, was found dead by police in Woodland on uh, July the 27th after being reported missing. Um, the stress and long hours of the job had contributed to her death. What, what, do you, what do you find as a GP? What kind of hours are you working? Is this, is this really, are you stressed? Do you, do you know your colleagues are in the same situation? I, I'm not as stressed as my colleagues because I didn't abandon very basic principles of good medicine. I've maintained continuity of care. I know my patients. I, we have a small list. I haven't adopted every um, carrot that the government have dangled into general practice to make us actually destroy our own careers, such as email access, telephone calls. And I never closed my doors through the pandemic because I knew this was a trap being set up for GPs to destroy the doctor-patient relationship. So I'm, I'm managing very well, and I find it quite therapeutic to be on shows like this, to get it off my chest, what's going on. Because what was more stressful is remaining quiet about the, the unfolding tragedy. Now, the NHS is dysfunctional. We have a shrunk hospital capacity. The hospital is dumping patients at home who shouldn't be at home because there's no bed for them. More and more clinics are being shut by the hospital. So they're in effect, they're treating the GP as their junior doctors who would have seen followed up people in clinic. So they're emptying out their clinics. They're dumping patients who aren't well to be discharged home. And where does all that pressure end up? It ends up on the GP. There's a shrinking pool of GPs. Many people are finding the stress too much and they're looking for a way out. Either they're leaving the country or they're drifting into the private sector, I'm afraid, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a huge crisis. And unfortunately, the GPs are so ground down that they didn't look up and see the bigger picture because this is part of the engineered destruction of traditional general practice, because we're all going to be sucked into this corporatized NHS run by private companies. And actually they don't want doctors doctors are seen as a cost center because we might advocate for the patient. They want a downskilled workforce. They want doctors replaced by nurses and physiotherapists and pharmacists. They, in fact, there's a proposal this week that the government's going to expand the bed capacity by turning your own bed at home into a hospital bed and say, we're gonna, and we're gonna monitor you from home. So apparently, uh, Crispin, there are thousands of beds. They're just your own at home. That's what's going on. That's what we're being softened up for at the moment. So I can't get my head around that. Uh, no, this just sounds like the, the, the situation of the energy uh, crisis. We've got no political party speaking out on this. And we rely on you to tell us the story because they're not telling us. Um, well, let, now, let, I, have to let, ask you, I have to ask you this, uh, Bob, sorry. Are you in any danger as a GP for speaking out? Crispin, I had to accept a few years ago that um, my career and livelihood was on the line. Yeah. That's what I had to accept before I spoke up. But actually, it's been liberating to speak up. There have been threats against me. I had um, the GMC suddenly deciding to in inquire about my details, whether they were current and up to date after I posted something that people saw was a bit 
suggestive and uh, implicit. I was trying to imply something about the connection between somebody within the BMA who also worked for the for NHS England, which is a blatant conflict of interest. So, so I've had uh, I've also had managers um, come up to me, try and befriend me, and then another group of managers threaten me, saying, "Do you still want to have a practice to work in?" So. Wow. They've thrown quite a bit at me. I'm I'm carrying on because I'm doing the right thing. And I cannot sit by and watch the care of my patients go down and down and down. I've already lived through a, you know, several of my patients dying prematurely because of the chaos uh, within the hospitals. And the reason I know and support Chris Day is because the trust, Lucian and Greenwich Trust is the main hospital for my patients as well. So I see the danger that you know the staff have to work in in a very overstretched system within that hospital. Well, Rod, uh, thank you so much for coming on again, and and and, uh, and and we're getting lots of messages of support and solidarity for you. And uh, if they ever do come for you, you've got all us behind you, and we'll we'll raise as much money for any law legal stuff as well. Good, or I can be I can <laughs> be your co-host. Yeah, but you have to wear a hat. Is that, okay. Is that okay? Yeah. No problem, no problem. All right, all right. Ch cheers, Bob. Thanks. Thanks.